title of today's show says it all, but I'll say it again just for fun. It's a big day for Penn State football decision day for potential five-star quarterback Matt Zollers, who is choosing between realistically four schools, realistically three schools, um, later today on Thursday. If you're watching this here live with us, welcome to BWI Live. I'm Thomas Frank Carr. Ryan Snyder and Sean Fitz with me as well. Um, we're going to get to Matt Zollers here in just one second, but guys, I just want to read the temperature of the room. I want to get just an initial, like, eyebrows up. Maybe not a good thing. I don't know. Fitz, welcome to the show. How you doing? Give us a temperature of what's going on. I had a whole thing in my head, and it just kind of face planted. Are we so getting the Zollers now or Fitz, a save we me. don't quite make it to the microphone, but that's yeah. okay, because we're just here to get 1% better each day. By the way, for all of those that were worrying last week, I got my recycling out this morning before the show, so good. thank you for checking on me. I thought about that this morning as I was dragging it out there, so I appreciate the uh, thoughts and prayers on that one. Yes, decision day for Matt Zollers uh, this afternoon at Spring Forward. Um, top four... Um, I, I think everybody's looking at Missouri, Georgia, Penn State, Pittsburgh also in it. His brother's a defensive lineman at Pittsburgh. He was one, that was one of the final choices or one of the final visits that he took. Um, so you can't rule that out. But you, he also took a trip to Bama, and I think we're pretty much ruling Bama out. Um, it's just I don't, I don't think the timing worked out for that. Um, but yes, he'll he'll make that announcement today. And it hasn't been a ton of confidence on Penn State side. I, I don't I'm flat out saying I don't think he's going to Penn State. I don't know where he's going, but I don't think he's going to Penn State. Um, and that's that's a, that's a tough one that we'll talk about the dynamic of of that potential miss um, coming a little bit uh, over the next hour, I guess. But, uh, yeah, I mean, just uh, flying right off the top, I guess I'll go with that. All right. Well, you're setting the table for us and for that conversation. But before we get to that, because I want to get this out of the way right now, not because I, I think we, you know, it's a thing to get out of the way, but also I want to make room for a really long conversation about that. So first off, our sponsor of today's show is My Perfect Franchise. If you're looking for a way to change your life and to really have your own American dream, the only way to do that, to, to set your future, is to set your financial future. If you're ready to leave the corporate rat race for the American dream, side hustle, diversify, build wealth, whatever it might be, owning your own business, owning your own franchise is a great way to do that. Check out My Perfect Franchise with Andy Ludicky. Give you the number right now and then at the end so you know it as well. 404-973-9901. Andy at MyPerfectFranchise.net. I'm not a business person. So when we talk to Andy once every year or so, he's thrown all kinds of businesses at us of what's hot, what's not men's health. I can tell you generally men's health is very uh, busy right now. It's a growing industry. So if that's something that you are passionate about, maybe you uh, have some training in medical or pharmaceuticals, any of those things, eh, maybe give him a call. Um, but it doesn't matter what's going on with the economy. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. There's always some part of the American economy that is growing or there's an opportunity to invest. So he's got the experience to help you navigate this whole process of owning a franchise. Uh, he's had to do all the hard things. He's had to fire friends. He's had to get rid of businesses. He's had to cut his losses and he's found a successful path forward. He wants to share that with you. His services are 100% free. He's here to help if you have any questions about business ownership. Andy at myperfectfranchise.net or 404 973 9901. So, Fitz set us up with the particular vibe about this conversation, Ryan, but I want to back up a little bit. Matt Zoller's on campus Friday to check out spring practice. What feedback were you able to get from Zoller's and what was kind of your read going into the Southern Swinger? He went to Alabama on Monday and he went to Georgia on Tuesday. How were, how were your conversations or your uh, interactions with him during that time period? They're fine. I mean, what you would expect, right? I mean, he needed to see Andy Koldnecki up close and, and Danny O'Brien and working practice and all those good things. So that... That was all fine. I mean, I just, uh, you know, I felt like it felt like for a little while now that UGA and Missouri had his attention. And, you know, leaving that Missouri visit, there was a lot of talk that, you know, Missouri's kind of emerging as the team there. And for many reasons, right? Um, I'm sure there's, we'll, we'll find out in the coming, coming weeks. But, um, you know, I think Penn State did just everything that they, that they could really do for this one. And it's not, you know, if he ends up elsewhere, I don't think there's any fault of the staff or NIL or really anything. I mean, I, I think they've really put their best foot forward here. Um, at the end of the day, I, 
he's never been a Penn State fan or a Pitt fan. Like there's no real local ties like there are for so many other recruits in the area. And that was something we stressed right off the bat was that, yeah, Penn State will get him on campus a lot, but there isn't, you know, he didn't grow up going to Penn State games or anything like that. So his family was always open to to whatever. And and I think we might, we might end up seeing that, but Hey, look, I, I also don't remember the last time that there were no RPM picks and crystal balls and all that stuff, five, six yeah. hours out of it. So, I mean, this one does seem like one to certainly keep an eye or tune in for, I guess. It, it but seems like the, the feedback Ryan, is elsewhere. Go ahead. Just your interactions that these, this group of people, you know, Matt Zoller's, his parents and the people that are advising him, they seem to keep things pretty close to the vest, like kind of to just support what you were saying. Is that, yeah. is that Matt's your always been that way. feeling of that way? Matt's always been that way. I mean, okay. read every, I mean, he, he'll give a ton of interviews and obviously we really appreciate it, but uh, he's never been, he's never one of those guys. that's like, all right, you know, this school's emerging as a favorite or, you know, this school really moved up my list. They've all been very, everyone's equal, steady Eddie, you know, and, and I think he's been that way from the jump. So it's always because of that, it's always been a little hard to read. Um, you know, his parent, his dad or, Mom, dad, they, they haven't really done many interviews. And I don't really think there's a lot of even coach interviews out there. It's always been through Matt. And, you know, he's 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 handled it as a professional kind of would, always kind of saying the right things and not slipping up and, you know, saying this, that, and a third. So, um, and, and that's good because, I mean, Spring Ford is not a D1 factory. He's not coming right. from a spot where they know how to play the recruiting game. He's just kind of taking it by taking it visit by visit, stride by stride. And every, every school that, you know, that he's involved with the feedback is like, Hey, they're extremely detailed about this. They asked us really good questions. And, uh, you know, you, you just hope that you can answer those things. And I, I believe them when they say he didn't have a decision coming into these things. I've said that pretty much ad nauseum for the last couple of weeks. Um, and judging from the feedback that we've gotten from people at, uh, our, our Georgia site is really good. Um, and Georgia doesn't know right now, Kirby smart, supposedly doesn't know right now like that that should tell you something about coming down here but again we talked to enough people on this side where we kind of feel that you know it's it's going to be one of those sec schools so i guess how does i, I don't want to move on i guess to the impact and the fallout and all those particular talking points i guess i just kind of want to take a step back and let you guys have a conversation about it how do you guys feel about this particular recruitment and and um how it's gone for penn state and you know, you guys kind of set the table. If you don't think it's coming to Penn State, you think they did everything they could, not really like, oh no, what did they do here? But I guess how this has unfolded and, and how the Southern schools have really captured his interest, I guess I'm just curious about your perspective a little deeper on some of those those topics. Yeah, we've we got levels here. I mean, there's this is not a uh, cut and dry thing. And if you look at the recruitment, this is not a guy that, you know, some guys, they you, you say they wait too long to offer or, you know, you just kind of drag your feet or something like that. It really wasn't the case. I mean, he was offered in early November, which f you hate to say first big offer because, you know, powerful, powerful offers are all, you know, it's, it's all great when everybody gets a scholarship. But um, Penn State was really early on him, had him in camp, was really effusive about the way that they recruited him even before um, they, they offered him a scholarship. And then they got on and went hard after him and, um, that's the, that's kind of the split right there is that November, uh, you, you take a commitment from Beckham Kritza and you think Kritza can be a player at this level, but at the same time, that's, that's a, that's a one in that, in that quarter, quarterback category. You look at Georgia, you look at Missouri, um, there's, there's no other like major contender here that has another quarterback. And while the kid can say that it's not an issue, it's one of those things that you just kind of look at and you say, yeah, absolutely. It is absolutely. It's going to be a situation that issue is probably a strong word but it's something that you have to work around that you did i don't want to say did to yourself but like that's kind of how this is like you've you've kind of put yourself in a position where you have to convince a kid to come to a two quarterback class as opposed to being the guy and especially when that guy is uh was in colorado now is in is in miami that's uh that, that's gonna be one that you know I'm not, I'm not sure the staff is, is really second guessing, but that's one that we'll second guess. Like if, if it's a situation where it's going to cost you a guy that eventually was your number one guy as Matt Zoller's was down the stretch, that's, that's one that's, that's tough. Like it's, it's tough to, uh, it's tough to put that one in words. So Penn state did a lot of right things in this recruitment and they still got beat. And that's, 
that's an issue for James Franklin. That's an issue for Andy Kolarnicki, Danny O'Brien, all those guys. You, you got beat. That is, you got to tip your hat and go, go to the next guy. I think they'll stay on Zollers. Um, but, uh, yeah. but it's, uh, it's a tough one to, to stomach. So that level right there is you can do a lot of things right. And I think we're in that, that era, that era, excuse me, in, uh, in recruiting right now where you can do most of the things right. And there's some things that you can't equalize on. Ryan. Just jump in here. Like, what do you think of the situation? Uh, I mean, Sean hit on everything, right? I mean, it's I don't I don't know how much nil is going to play a part. I mean, there's there's certainly a lot of talk that Missouri has uh, the biggest bag, if that makes sense. And if it was Missouri, I think a lot of people will wonder, you know, how much that had an impact over a school like Georgia. Uh, you know, Sean, you kind of mentioned on the board earlier this week that you know Georgia and Alabama, they certainly have. Uh, deep pockets, I guess you'd say, but they don't, they do go about it similarly to the Penn state where they're not just throwing crazy money at kids who haven't proven anything. So that's just one thing I'll be looking for. You know, if it was to be the Missouri, I would be curious because we know Missouri with uh, Luther burden, some other guys like they have done that in the past. So just be curious to see how that works out uh, or how, how that works out. You know, Penn State's going to absolutely stay on them regardless. Uh, I don't really see them yeah. s- stopping. Go ahead. T. Ryan. Yes, okay. This is this is was something I was curious about, and with as much details they've put into this recruiting process, with the questions they've asked, how even-handed they've been, is he a guy that you could see flipping down the road, or do you feel like this commitment, this is the decision for Zollers, understanding that anything can happen? Like, I guess, what's your temperature on the likelihood of those things? I don't, I don't. I mean, from my interactions with him, I don't see him as that one of those guys who's going to make two or three commitments. I don't. I, I, th- I would. I would bet that he sticks with what he has, especially because of quarterback recruitments, and usually it's that's a it's important, you know, to, to, to keep your quarterback firm and, you know, other schools will, wherever he commits to is going to do everything they can to make sure that wouldn't happen. So I, I would lean towards it being final, but that, that doesn't mean Penn State's going to stop. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I'm still not even a hundred percent writing off that it's definitely not going to be Penn State yet, just because word usually leaks out. It has not leaked out yet. So <laughs> uh, we'll see. I, I, I'm not optimistic, but I'm not completely writing it off yet either. So Fitz, this is a conversation going on in the chat. I, I think you brought this up as well. I think this is just an interesting concept. Bain Train says the way football is being built now with the transfer portal, I don't even think the freshman commitment matters that much. I I, I wouldn't go that I wouldn't go that far. Yeah. But he does make a couple. He makes a couple of points of things that have worked out. You talk about um, Penix, Burrow. Jalen Hurts, all guys that have transferred later in their career and uh, were were successful for other teams. It cost a lot of NIL money as well. Yeah. Also I mean, want to point out the schools they transferred from had other five-star quarterbacks or right. highly recruited players. Like, it's not just the... You still got to have the input to then survive and in, the output. And, and, and Indiana, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I think there's... And Indiana. Hey, yeah. hey we got more levels here. We're, we're doing a, a level show today here. Um, but, uh, yes, the, the, the number one thing there, relationships don't matter. So don't, uh, don't play the scorn lover here. Just like stay with it and respect the decision. And then, you know, Julian Fleming came back around. Nolan Rucci came back around. That's, that's, that's part of the game these days. Um, I'm not going to go with the, uh, freshman commitment doesn't really matter that much because the bulk of your roster is still going to be these guys. The bulk of your roster is still going to be guys that, that, that start with you from the beginning, but you need to pick up pieces. Ryan made a good point there that, uh, hey, these quarterbacks that I, I, I don't want to I don't want to equate it to the rookie wage scale in the NFL, but it's um, it's a certain price for really good f- high school freshman quarterbacks. Um, but then you get later in your career and you get some guys that are maybe appealing options. Those are going to cost probably a stratosphere that Penn state isn't comfortable going to. And that's just right. the way that they do things. And I think that there's a lot of schools like that, but there's, you know, a couple that would splash uh, here and there. And then the success of Penix, the success, success of Joe Burrow, um, Bo Nix, but yeah, Bo Nix, like, yeah. and Bo Nix was, I don't even think Bo Nix was a guy that you splashed for Like it just yeah. happened to come around for the right fit there. That's gotta be what Penn state does. Like if you're going to find a quarterback late in his career, it's gotta be, a diamond in the rough, I guess. I mean, you know, you, you knew Bo, Bo Nix was talented, but it just didn't didn't work out. And you gotta think that you can make the most of it. So, yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be a tough one. It's hey, a lot of people like to play blackjack, but when you go into a casino on a weekend and they up the levels on the on the blackjack hands, like some people can't play. Like Penn State right now is hovering around the table, and I'm not sure that they're ready to, to jump into that because it's so freaking crazy. And I think we're yeah. probably in like a 
two year window where that's going to be the case. Um, and it's going to be tough and you're going to see, um, and probably we're going to talk about this a little bit later with, with Trent Wilson, but you're going to see guys that you do a lot of the things right for. And then all of a sudden can spin on a dime or many dimes, if you will. Um, and, <laughs> and it could be a situation where, you know, things, things don't go great. So you've got to learn to work around that. You've got to learn to learn to adjust to that. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's really tough to, uh, it's really tough to break through, especially as we talked before, Penn state has great infrastructure, but you know, it's going to take more than great infrastructure to, to get it done for those guys that can get you over the hump. And I think that that's yeah. the tough thing here. I mean, it's funny you say the word infrastructure and to be literal about that, they were behind on the battle for infrastructure before NIL became a thing. So like if you're adding up the thing just historically over time, uh, some of these negatives, but uh, the, the point about being appealing on offense, um, Andy Kotal, Nikki, I wrote about this earlier this week, just generally spitballing, because those things, uh, you know, the tight lip nature of who from an emotional standpoint is in the lead or who is most most appealing, who fits really well. And looking at these offenses, I think Zoller's and his family did a great job of finding schools that fit his capabilities. He's he's a he's a top passer in college football recruiting, so he should fit multiple schemes. But if you look at Georgia and you look at Missouri and you look at uh, Penn State specifically, those three offenses are similar given what Andy Kotelnicki is bringing to Penn State. And it was a decent fit, but it's a projection. So, um, Ryan, you've said this before. The best way for Penn State to get the next five-star quarterback is to have success with the one they currently have. Right. Do you still or feel both. that way? No matter. Just have any success with any of them at yeah. this point. You know, I mean, and that's, not that Aller, I mean, Aller's going to be the guy, don't get me wrong, but just, you know, obviously Bo and his, his feed and Col what Kotelnicki will do. I, I don't really know that it even matters it, it, between the two okay. at this point. Um, I'd still lean towards Aller's being incredibly important. I don't want to overthink that or fancy that the wrong way. But, yeah, I mean, I, this, they got a lot to prove. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Penn State's, you know, issues last year have been used against them here. I mean, of course they have the summons. Absolutely. They have. Huh. It, it, what's that? Absolutely, they have. They have. Yeah, them. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Just like I think Kritza having a two quarterback class probably used against them, you know. And, and there's, there's there are layers there that schools can certainly recruit against and give them a lot to think about. Go ahead, Sean. No, I, I agree with that, and that's it, it's. I don't want to say easy to um, negatively recruit Penn State for a quarterback, but it, you know, it fairly it, it, the case is is right right there in front of you. So, mm -hmm. um, what do they have to do? They have to be appealing, and and the the thing is like when you change coordinators uh, you're doing it for a reason obviously penn state doing it for a reason um but uh there's a couple ways that that can go it can go with um hey the new guy is new coach bump so much excitement and then there's also hey i have to see this before i believe it and i think we're in the latter with uh yeah. with a guy like matt zollers yeah and, and just to <laughs> kind of put a fine point on it i like missouri's offense and i think obviously georgia is uh proven commodity right and there's a kind of a misconception for people that don't watch georgia that they run a big 10 stereotype sort of offense they, they use similar concepts and they use similar ways of attacking that a lot of the top offenses that are spread offenses use like they use a lot more rpo than you might think they throw the ball deep more than you might think and they complement that with a five-star running game like with literally high level recruits on the offensive line to support all those things so if you're looking for a place to have success, it's interesting Georgia hasn't, have they gotten the 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 quarterbacks that would um, match their production in terms of wins? And, and it, it feels like there is a, the, a final hump for them to overcome of getting a quarterback that hits really well and then, you know, goes on to be highly drafted or so. I guess I'm searching for some sort of situation. They there had where, one last year. <laughs> and then he was yeah. Twist, he he did, at the end. Yeah, Carson Beck's really good. Um, the, I think, I think the state that, or the, the, the stat that I read from Jake Rowe, um, from our Georgia site was Georgia's never won an SEC championship with a quarterback that wasn't from Georgia. Mm. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Um, and I'm looking here and of course, Matthew Stafford has kind of set the bar for them, but that's been, oh, that's been 15 years now. So may, maybe even more. Um, so there's that. Um, but you look at what they had and it's really interesting because Jacob Eason was Drew Aller basically. 
Yeah. But Jake Fromm won the national championship or excuse me, won the SEC championship, lost in the national championship game. And then Stetson Bennett came along, the little engine that could, and he was their most successful from a team standpoint ever. And now, you know, Carson Beck, I think is really good. Um, he was pretty highly regarded, if I recall. I, I don't know if he was a five star, but I think he was top 100. Um, but yeah, it's been really interesting to watch the wave of quarterbacks. And, you know, it's not always the not always the number one guy. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts here on this particular conversation? You know, any meat left JT on the bone? Too. Ah, man, it, JT, that was one of JT Daniels nine schools. So, <laughs> well, uh, that, yeah, that one felt like it was so long ago. I was going to bring up Justin Fields, but he transferred. So like th there have been, they have obviously gotten talent, but it hasn't necessarily clicked the same way. And a guy that like Zollers, who has the athleticism to run some of their read option stuff and has the arm to take advantage of those talented receivers like Lad McConkey and, uh, all the guys that are in the draft right now, Brock Bowers, uh, you think of the, the, the receiving talent they've had, pair that with a guy with a stronger arm and, and a little bit better quarterback, and it just seems like that's the final thing there. Fitz, what do you all got? Right, one, 180 here from a question in the thread. Number one, we got off the air yesterday, like 10 <laughs> seconds after Adam Schefter changed the or tweeted about the trade of Stefan Diggs to the Texans, and your face was priceless and i one of my big regrets on this show is that we did not get that in the time to see your face number two how bad do you want lad mcconkey to be a buffalo bill oh quite bad yeah so uh cory put this in the chat and uh, for people here on the uh, on the podcast i know it's a recruiting show but love to hear t frank's thoughts on Diggs trade uh for sticky buns and a scoop of creamery ice cream yeah um i feel a little bit better about it seeing what other receivers have gone for over time that are have a big cap number and are later in their career. So that made me feel a little bit better knowing they at least got a second back next year and they're going to clear a bunch of cap space. But yeah, when we got off the air, I was like, what? No, sir. Like, because of course it was blindsided. I, I There have been rumors about Diggs being traded for like two years now. So you get a, you get inoculized to those things. And when it finally happens, it is actually surprising. The problem I have is Lad McConkey kind of fits a, a certain style that the Bills have, which is, they don't have anybody that's big. Like their their number one receiver from like a physicality and, and catch point is Dalton Kincaid. Like, you know, they've got a bunch of guys that are six foot and under. Curtis Samuel's 200 pounds, but he's not like a, a number one receiver. And Diggs wasn't like a number one receiver build. So I would love Roma Dunze. You know, they do something stupid. You're not getting Roma Dunze, buddy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Sorry, I got bad news for you. <laughs> Brandon Bean loves to trade up. This is turning into a Bills uh the, the show which we don't need to get too much farther but uh brandon bean loves the trade-up so just keep keep your head on a swivel right. um that's, that'd be a that's go that's gonna cost you a pretty penny I, he's not a unfortunately he's not afraid to do it uh so we can come back to any questions you might have about mad zollers in the chat anything i missed in the conversation is there something else you want to talk about uh let us know but uh, this also coming out this week trent wilson in our penn state recruiting news segment makes his top four known Ohio State, Texas A&M, Penn State, and Oklahoma. Ryan, you tweeted this out. Uh, that's probably not a good thing for Penn State in no. response to that. Why? No, definitely not. Uh, first off, it would be he's committing on April 10th, which is two, a couple days before he was supposed to visit Penn State. I think that says a lot. Yeah, he's been to <laughs> Penn State more than any other school, but he just got back from Oklahoma, which uh, – I think it was his only visit to OU, which is very interesting. Um, it's 2024 modern day recruiting. I don't know how else to put it, but it sounds like he's going to be a sooner. And uh, yeah, that's that, that one hurts. I mean, Penn State did a great job with defensive tackle last year, so it's not crushing, but it's it just comes back to like how many of these DMV top D linemen can they keep missing on? Because it's, it there feels like there's a line of them. No, yeah. I wouldn't say a line of them, but you know, there's a handful over the last couple of years where. You know, everything looks really good for a while, and then poof, they end up elsewhere. So doesn't doesn't sound good for Penn State on that one either. So it's a very dreary and miserable show we're having here as far as for <laughs> Penn State fans are concerned. What, what, we have like yeah. five people tuned in at this point. Jeez. Yeah, we, well, welcome to – we got a, a larger crowd than normal because obviously it's a big conversation with Matt Zolders. But, uh, yeah, welcome to Bummer Hour for Penn State fans. Uh, <laughs> I was also going to say, like, this is going to be – this could have been – uh, a St. Francis pickup, if you want to call it that, seeing as he at one point was, he at, was Saint at St. Francis. Francis. He's not there anymore. Yeah. No, I know. I know. But like at one point, like if we're, if you want to get a win in the column for Penn State, you might count that. <laughs> um, Fitz, this is the second time this has happened to them, right? This spring, in terms of a defensive tackle who 
shows interest in Penn State, and then, oh, whoops, never mind. Uh, at least that's how the way Ryan is reading it. So, you know, I don't know. Do, do you have any other thoughts on that particular conversation? I think I, if you're referring to Landon Rink, I think that one's a little bit different. He okay. uh, ended up committing to Texas A&M. He's a Texas kid. So, like, the situations there, the parallels there are a little bit different. Like, you were expecting to get him on campus mm-hmm. at the end of March and then for an official visit to do what you can. But he's going to go to Texas A&M as a Texas kid. I think that that's kind of a different pool than – Trent Wilson, a Maryland kid going to Oklahoma. And uh, yeah, that's a, that was an interesting one because he went to Ohio State after he went to Oklahoma. And still, the pull for Oklahoma was there. So I think that that's, uh, that was pretty, pretty strong. So it'd be interesting to, to see how that recruitment continues to progress. But that one, that one was one where that, that, again, turned on a dime. And you're going to have those. Uh, we talked about, talked about that on the show last week with USC. But I think there's going to be those ones that just are – all of a sudden, hey, this kid had four official visits set up when he narrowed it to four on Monday. And then Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday, I think it was Wednesday, um, mm-hmm. put out he's deciding on the 10th. That's a pretty quick turnaround if you're if you're anybody, really. Yeah, so, something yeah. changed his mind pretty rapidly. Um, <laughs> do you expect that to happen again? Like, I don't know. Do you expect that to keep happening, Ryan? Like, is this the year where a lot of this NIL stuff well, is really going to hit home in a detrimental way for teams that aren't willing to spend on look, Penn order? State? I was, I texted this to Sean yesterday. Like, there's always a period of a couple weeks at some point throughout the year, uh, every class where, you know, fans get all upset and you know Penn State's going to lose out a handful of top guys in a six week span and everybody feels like everything's coming to an end or terrible you know the the one thing I would say is that in previous years a lot of times their their class would rank a little bit higher than what this one does right now Uh, because you know I think fans look at the class right now is like well there's some talent in there but there's also some questions that um, we don't always have um, you know as far as some of the players but uh, I'm not we see this every year is, is my point. So yeah, there's probably going to be another two, two or three players here in this stretch that say, Hey, you know what? I'm not going to do official visits. They're going to commit elsewhere and fans will get upset about it. But you know, you can go back every year and, and find that little six, seven, eight week period where that kind of happens. So but to just get to official visits, man, their, their official visits schedule stacked. You know, they're going to pull a surprise or two, I think, um, you know, or I guess maybe just guys that we're not talking about as much talented players. And then, you know, there's those, those handful of guys that we have been on, uh, discussing a ton over the last six, seven, eight months uh, who they're in good shape with. So I think Trent Wilson does, definitely hurts just because of the amount of visits, you know, and you, you go back to Jason Moore, you go back to Brian Bessie, like there's a lot that there's yeah. just been a theme there at times where it feels really good for Penn state and, and it, it just doesn't happen. And this kind of feels like the next one. Although I don't know if I'd put Trent Wilson in the Brian Bessie uh, category yet, but my point is it just, Felt good and doesn't look too good anymore. Yeah. So you mentioned this, and Fitz, I want to talk to you about this, is the the idea of you got Ethan Grunkmeyer last year. You can absorb a loss of a Matt Zoller is because you have done a good job, and I think we all think very highly of Ethan Grunkmeyer. Um, and then you have uh, a big class on the defensive line last year, but we also talked about like there are a lot of um, – high risk, high reward players there as well. So can you absorb missing on top talent at defensive tackle and still take those incremental steps forward that I think fans are always hoping is going to be giant leaps of each year you get a high four-star defensive tackle. But, you know, uh, do, do you think that they've done enough with the guys they've recruited with Dion Barnes last year that you can absorb this if you still get a quality prospect that maybe isn't as uh, highly recruited as Wilson later on? couple things um you can absorb some of that stuff it's recruiting it's college football it's in an exact science and you know 50 you go 50 50 in a class and you're feeling pretty good about production number two your job is to stack talent your job as a college coach or a recruiting staff is to get these guys in and then find somebody better in the next class to compete with that guy that's where it hurts like you can talk about zollers you can talk about grunkmeyer you can talk about hey i feel great with grunkmeyer but at the end of the day your job is to get the best guys in and then replace them with better guys. And that is, that's where this one hurts. Like I, and, and I don't, I'm, I'm not saying Matt Zoller is going to be better than Ethan Grunkmeyer or, or the other way around, but your job is to establish who you think is going to be good, bring them in, sign them, get them onto your roster. And that is the, that's the F word here. That's the failure here is that you're, mm-hmm. you're, you want to stack as much as you put, as you possibly can. And you want to keep away from other ones. The, the one thing I will say, and you're going to say, 
Matt Zoller is an in-state kid and absolutely it is. And that, it hurts from that perspective, dominate the state, yada, yada, whatever. Um, but when it comes to quarterbacks, things are a little bit different. Georgia is pressing for Matt Zoller's because Juju Lewis, who is from Georgia, is top, what is he? Five, he I think he's a five-star, close to a five-star. Yeah, maybe five Zoller's star. actually rates ahead of him now, I think by one three, but go on. Um, he's going to USC. Like, and because quarterbacks are such um, a premium position, because that's how quarterback recruiting is gone. Yep. You kind of erase state lines when it comes to that. And while it hurts to lose an in-state guy, it's probably a little bit different than if you lost. You know, you just did an interview with Kevin Brown this morning, and he's a 2026 guy, but he's just the first name that popped into my head as a Pennsylvania guy. That stings more as an in-state loss than the quarterback, just because the quarterback is so all-encompassing in, in college football. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, that that's a fair point there. Um, Kevin Gillis. Another thing with Georgia, chat. too, is like they yeah, they got Puglisi last year. But obviously, they missed on Raiola, but they didn't. I don't think they took a quarterback in 2023. So, like, they need young quarterback talent. They have one in 2026, too. Yeah, they have one committed. And the, oh, other, okay. the other interesting thing, Missouri doesn't have a commit in 2025. That's who. Yeah, I was going to bring that yeah. up earlier. Amazing Crazy. to me. That's, I mean, we're pretty deep into this to not have a commit. Um and do, do you read anything into that, or is that just happenstance? I, I do, we don't have a Missouri site, which kind of sucks. Um, yeah. And you know, we're close with our Georgia site, so that's kind of where like a lot of the information sharing is going in that direction. And with the national guys, and we got Steve Wilfong on uh, on board this week, so he's been in Chad Simmons, so they've done a, a really good job with this for a, a recruitment where you can't can't really say one way or the other until the kid announces. I, I think. Uh, Z-Man says, this is an inevitable show we didn't want to hear, but need to listen anyway. Appreciate you saying that, Z-Man. Appreciate you. Sky isn't actually falling. Make sure that last part's in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sky isn't actually falling. Uh, Kevin Gillick asks, what's up with Quincy Porter? I understand it's a long shot, but frankly, he's exactly what we need to get this passing game back into gear. Uh, I'm just going to quote Fitz. Quincy Porter, probably the top guy at receiver, probably not going to Penn State. Um, he did re he did visit recently he did visit, though. He visited on Friday. Yeah. And, how you know, they, uh, do you guys have any read on that things? And then he turns around and he's got Ohio state and Michigan this week. So I think Ohio state and Michigan, probably the two top leaders. The, the interesting wrinkle with Ohio state is they took Desi Jones over the weekend. Uh, Desi mm -hmm. Jones from North Jersey was on Penn state's board. But when you take a look at the level that they've recruited wide receivers at Ohio state under Brian Hartline, um, I, I gotta admit that that was a surprising one for me. Deshaun is, Stewart was a surprise too. I know that's a different position, but like Deshaun Stewart. I was, Stewart I was less surprised by Stewart because they always seem to go into Jersey and, and pull out a guy that you're like, would they take him? And mm -hmm. Stewart was one of those guys this year who I think is a really good player. I don't know that he's the – You look, it, it's unfair to him because you look at what they've recruited in the secondary at Ohio State in the 2025 class, and it's like number one corner, number three corner, number five corner. I think they're in it, Dorian Brew. You know, the, the, it yeah. is a ridiculous stacking, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm I, I'm surprised by that, but I'm I'm more surprised with uh, with Desi Jones when you take a look at what's on the board, just from a Penn State perspective and how well they've recruited Ohio State uh, at receiver. Yeah, and and just even if Chip Kelly comes in and it's a different offense or there's a different emphasis, like I did, you know, five ten one seventy five. So I was thinking to m in my head, like, well, they like to run the ball. Chip Kelly likes to run the football. I know he's a spread offense. They like to run the football. Is that a part of? I wouldn't say that like that's a who knows like that's just speculation. I'm going to get out of the speculation cycle by talking about weekend visits, guys. That's coming up here uh, starting today. You know, I always like to think of Thursday as the weekend. It makes makes it seem less more palatable. Um, so there's uh, there's there's some names coming to campus today through Saturday. Ryan, um, kind of like the the conversation with Matt Zollers. I'm just going to kind of get out of the way and let you talk about some dudes. So you start us off and then just go through whoever you want to talk about here coming up over the next couple of days. Yeah, I, I will start. I mean, just I'll go today, Sean. You can go on the Saturday, guys. But I think today there's two two players that fans really need to know about. Nolan Davenport, offensive lineman out of, uh, is it Massilloin, I believe, in, in Ohio. Uh, just got an offer from Penn State. Uh, what was it? Maybe a week or two ago. It was pretty recently. Uh, and, that, and that grabs my attention for a few reasons. Uh, he has been on campus before. Uh, came to a game. I believe it was UMass back in October. Then was at a junior day recently. Um, and I think this is a player who, let's see how today's visit goes. We'll get feedback on that. But I wouldn't be shocked if he eventually is added to the official visit list down the road. Uh, let's, again, I know he's going to Missouri and some other schools in there. But like if, if Penn State decides to really push for this 
for, for Nolan Davenport, I think he's a player that they, they can land. And I also think it kind of speaks a little bit to Malachi Goodman. You know, that situation kind of feels like he was supposed to visit last week, decided to go to Alabama. That's probably not a good sign. Uh, you know, we'll see with Zaire Addison. He's got a lot of awesome options. Really likes Penn State, though. He, he's the guy that I think Penn State's going to have to push all out for. And, and maybe they're him and Michael Carroll are probably their, their top two offensive line targets at the moment. But the fact that they offered Davenport kind of when they did, getting him back on campus quickly does feel like a player that we need to have circled. He's a 2025 prospect. I don't know if I added that in there or not. But uh, the other one then, Marcelo Vitti, 2026, uh, listed as an athlete uh, out of Detroit, but would I think he would be a safety or um, – yeah, definitely a safety. Of course, um, his, for Penn his, State. he's got his name is an eval. He's <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's got Michigan, Michigan State. He's, he's got a bunch of quality quality offers. Has been on campus a few times already. Uh, so, certainly a, a, a player to keep an eye on. Again, twenty twenty six. So, don't need to overthink it too much. We'll, we'll see where things go. And I, obviously, be, being from Detroit and, and Michigan, seems to be on him pretty hard. You, you would think that the Wolverines will be in a good spot there, but. Uh, I think this is his third visit now uh, to Penn State. So that's a positive sign. And we'll see uh, where, where things go from there. Go ahead. Uh, one one note on Nolan Davenport, just checking out his film today and kind of assessing new offensive linemen or just generally new players. Seems like he'd be a very good fit in this offense. So, you know, scheme and, and, and player fit are also very important, not just the level of talent. And when you have guys that are athletic and can move, I think he's in that conversation of this is a really athletic offensive lineman in a scheme that's going to use outside zone concepts, pulling concepts, and everyone's going to be able to run. So mm-hmm. um, maybe he isn't a guy that has all of it together, but I think is a decent fit. And uh, you've seen Andy Cole and Nicky do a lot of good things with offensive linemen who maybe aren't the highest level recruits. Um, so sorry. I know I said I was going to step out, but I just mm-hmm. I, I thought that was an interesting uh, update looking at him and, and his talent. Fitz, you Sean, want to you take over here? Saturday? Uh, I can talk Saturday. Yeah. Um, a couple of guys and, and there's more on the list and uh, including the five star that uh, Ryan recruited last week. Justin Hill's the one that jumps out to me. I recruited uh, him, man. Woods in Cincinnati. Uh, what's that? You said I recruited him last week. I think you meant reported oh, on. Reported. It's, it's Sorry, I'm reading, uh, reading and talking is not my specialty. Um, <laughs> but linebacker defensive end, I would put him in the whatever he wants to be category. He's a really yeah. good player. Top 100 by on three, uh, four star by the on three industry rankings. Um, he's been a guy that's on the on the radar for a long time. Penn State wanted to uh, to get him out this winter, and now they're just going to get him out for a spring practice, going to get him back for an official visit. Um, he's one of those guys, I think, that uh, is good enough in Ohio to go to Ohio State. The RPM heavily suggests the Buckeyes. Um, but USC's in there. Uh, Alabama's in there. He's got uh, he's got some official visits that are pretty heavy heavy hitters. We got him listed at 6'3", 220. Um, I think just looking at his film, maybe – more of an edge prospect uh, than a traditional linebacker, but a guy that can just find the football and go flat out get it. Uh, big fan of Justin Hill. He's uh, not Abdul Carter, but it's it's a fair comparison. I, I was thinking he's just the way he runs. He looks a little Tony Rojasy. So mm-hmm. you know, I think he is on that line. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just see a guy who's going to grow into edge at some point. Yeah. yeah like he'll yeah, come yeah. in at linebacker and he'll be an edge by the time he leaves. If it would be bad. Penn State, of course, but we'll see. All right. Uh, Rashad Johnson safety from, uh, from Florida is coming up. Jacob Washington from, uh, from Louisiana wide receiver. Um, so, you know, spreading that, uh, spreading that, uh, that net pretty wide in a couple of positions where you've got some, got some options that are maybe a little bit closer to home, but, uh, just some names worth tracking for the weekend. Yeah. Big guy. Oh, Jacob Washington, six, three, one eighty five. You can see him, uh, his highlights here on the channel. Um, so those, those are the names we got coming up. Uh, another one that we have here on the list, I'm interested in, in 2026 player, but, uh, Max Sutter, you know, you want to talk about tight ends again. Here's another guy just watching his film this morning. Uh, wow. Is the first conversation that I want to have about Max Sutter is just this, this dude can move and like a couple of the guys that they've recruited at, at tight end that also play quarterback. I don't think he sucks at throwing the football. Like, it's just interesting. <laughs> you watch a guy who can do just a little bit of everything on film. What do you guys yeah. think about Sutter? I mean, good athlete. Uh, no doubt about that. I mean, he's, he's ranked, I think, a top 10 tight end in the country. Uh, this is his first visit to Penn State, so we'll get a better feel for, like, uh, you know, just how interested he is or, uh, you know, even even other things like how he measured up and stuff like that. I'm curious to, to learn a little bit more about that uh, later. I guess it would be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. But um, 
you know, he's going to, he's got, he's already been down to Bama. He's got quality offers, uh, you know, pretty much all the, the top Midwest schools and uh, certainly a player to, to keep an eye on. I'm not sure if he's going to be the next Lincoln Clark or, or Lincoln Cure or anything like that, but, uh, you know, Penn State's on him. Pretty, seems to be on him pretty hard from what I understand. Um, we got a question here in the chat, some kind of information, you know, who, what, when, where, why, uh, from Derek Moyer. He says, where will Matt Zoller's announce uh, today? Ryan, uh, uh, do, what, do you mean like as far as like YouTube or uh, his school's his school's supposed to be broadcasting it? Okay, so his school's broadcasting. He's he's announcing at his school, and it's at four p.m. Correct? Those those are the pertinent details, I think. Uh, but yeah. I'm also shooting. Let me look here. that up while you guys filibuster here, because I know okay. it's yeah their, well, their Kyle, school has a very really good youtube page because i've been watching his basketball games on their youtube page it's going to be yes. on their youtube page if you look i think it's like ram country tv yeah um three so watching some of their football time. games awesome broadcast mm -hmm. quality mm -hmm. three o'clock on the sf rams fb twitter feed three o'clock x feed okay. if you will okay uh, and kyle r just says our uh will fong just predicts uh mizzou for zolers so makes sense you know already already making an impact here at on three yeah yeah um, it makes sense doesn't surprise me yeah i, I, I would if... argue better for penn state if they better better missouri than than uh i than think Georgia. so i just yeah. don't know what the money is that game. i mean it's just like i know I figured the that money out. though like that's 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 the thing i mean because there's no doubt that uh, remember missouri doesn't have any commits right now so uh as far as the nil coffers go they're they're pretty heavy so that'd be the only thing i would i would wonder but yeah i mean down the road uh you know especially if missouri doesn't really put together a good class and they take a step back this year yeah we'll see by the way just got a text from greg it's 3 p.m and the link is in our story on our uh, on blue at illustrated.com to uh, make sure that's on. so thanks greg for, gets thanks so mad at me when greg. i do that greg's been all over this he, he dude, it's all over the place <laughs> yeah he gave me the rundown of the hollywood casino uh blackjack table standards um i I don't really go to casinos. That was just kind of more of an example, but we've got boots on the ground there in Greg, and he was he was able to provide some clarity there. He said it was a good example, so I'm feeling pretty good about that, seeing as if it's Greg. I, I, I love that we have a live fact checker and somebody who knows everything that's watching the show. So, Greg, as always, Greg providing excellent uh, support and utility, even when he's not a part of the show. Like, he's just, he's everywhere for Blue White Illustrated. Do you think they're going to, I guess, see it in the chat. Do you think they're going to go on to Malik Washington, Sean? Probably a question for tomorrow. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's when when you're checking with sources, you don't exactly say, "Hey, right, hey, when you miss this one, who, what, what's going to happen?" So, I mean, that's uh, it's going to be one that that we look at. I mean, he was on, he was just on campus, and it, the two were not connected. Like I know people want to connect the dots, but they they want to spread that net and and try and continue those relationships as they can. They like Malik Washington a lot. You've mentioned before um, a little bit more raw than uh, than probably given credit for. Um, but, uh, that's still a talented guy, guy that can throw the ball really well. Yeah. And a good runner. Like a guy, again, a guy that would fit really well in this offense and be able to do a little bit of everything. I'm still leaning towards, they're just going to stick with Kritza, but we'll see. That's my prediction. Yeah. Um, do you want to have the Quentin Martin conversation again? Uh, Kevin Gillick is in the chat asking about Quentin Martin, but, uh, we can refer him to any of the other shows where we talked about Quentin Martin playing receiver. So. I, um, I, I want to get more info on because on, we haven't seen in the last two weeks. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm more curious about that than putting him at receiver. I'm more <laughs> more curious about him playing on the field than playing where he plays out on the field. Yeah, yeah which is a, a great uh, Kevin. Check out uh, yesterday's show where we recap practice and some of those conversations over on the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel here. Um, you know, or if you listen on the podcast, you can listen to yes yesterday's podcast as well. Uh, so that's all I got, guys. Um, what do you have coming up? Obviously, we have the official announcement coming up later today. And then what are you tracking after that, Ryan? What's coming up for you with recruiting? just the weekend visitors? Um, you know, but it's not, it's not a really heavy list compared to last weekend. Uh, last weekend was a much deeper list. So I'm sure guys will be added to it. I mean, right now, Justin Hill is, is certainly the, the guy I would have circled as the, the player to watch for this weekend, not to watch for a commitment or anything like that, but it's the most maybe important 2025 uh, from that perspective. But, uh, I'm sure players will get added to it. We'll we'll check in with sources later tonight or tomorrow morning and, and see who maybe we may be missing. But uh it's you know, next week's blue white, right? So that's that's kind of the, the build up to that. Um uh, they'll obviously hope to get a, a really good crowd out for that game next week. Yeah. And 
then we'll be on to the spring evaluation period. So it doesn't look I like any commitments it. coming for a little bit, which I thought I, they might get one, but I don't know. Right now, I mean, Blue White usually lands one, but there's not really a guy I have circled right now. Yeah, Fitz, that's actually something I was I was curious about, not necessarily the commitment part, but does the Blue White game cast kind of a shadow over this week of practice where maybe I'll come up this weekend or I'll just come up for the Blue White game? Or is somebody, if they're thinking about that, are they just going to come up twice? Like, how, how do you see that working historically? Well, it's also the first weekend of trout season in Pennsylvania. So that's, you know, <laughs> it's going to throw everybody off. Yeah. Um, but now that, that if you can make a visit, if you're given the chance to visit this weekend or next weekend, you're taking next weekend because it's the Blue White game. So if it, if it fits into your schedule. So um, Justin Hill's not going to come for the Blue White game. So it makes sense for him to be here this weekend. Also, I believe you teased a mailbag question yesterday. Yes. And yeah. I got all excited. Also, I think I had a you're like, awkward. You were baiting, baiting, switching. Uh, whoever asked you don't have who who, who asked that question. But uh, yeah, we're gonna let's let's do that one. Yeah, it was Scott L. Um, and you're right. I I got there was an awkward transition where I flailed a little bit and went uh, too far down the 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 rundown here. But this is the question from Scott L. Who was on the mailbag show yesterday. Um, it, it used to be that a player only took official visits to the main schools that they were considering, but players are now allowed unlimited official visits. Uh, is it now harder for the staff to figure out who is really interested in Penn State versus those just taking free trips so as not to get to use up the still limited number of OV schools, OV, uh, official visits that schools are allowed? How do you how do you parse between? And I think this is also fair to ask you guys, like, how do you parse between somebody who is like, yeah, I'll check out Penn State. It doesn't cost me anything now in terms of like a limited number of resources and, and, and gauging real interest in this kind of wide open mm -hmm. world where some of the rules you had before feel like there's an erosion of those those kind of tentpole ideas ryan you've talked about you know track the visits doesn't provide mm -hmm. you the same security anymore well yeah i mean so a couple things one as he mentioned recruits are allowed unlimited official visits now it used to be five now of course you can only go to one school one time uh, but you can take six seven eight nine whatever it may be Unless you're uh, two country. yeah yeah 56 it was what schools used to have. Is it 56 or 50? I think it's 56. It 56. It's yeah, they're now allowed 70, but okay. those include transfer portal too. So um, that's part of that whole you know upgrade as far as uh, in total visits allowed. What I, the main thing I would say is yes and no. I mean, I can make cases for both of that. Like I've had, I've definitely have talked to sources about that. They're saying like it is a little more difficult to read when guys are taking more official visits for in April or squeezing something into May and then trying to get six or seven out of it. Like Max Buchanan, for example, offensive lineman, who I don't really think is going to end up at Penn State, does have an OV set for the end of June. He has seven official visits already lined up. So I think it may be a little bit more difficult to kind of read a kid like that. But the vast majority of these guys still are only doing four official visits in June, right? Yeah, it doesn't change for most of the population, most mm -hmm. of the population, because number one, most aren't good enough to just like make their own schedule. And that's mm -hmm. not a not trying to be a shot, but like most are not going to be like, Hey, I want to see Alabama, USC, Georgia, Notre Dame, Michigan, Ohio. Like most are not going to have that opportunity and staffs are trying to keep sort of tamper that one down. Like mm -hmm. because you're limited to how many you can get. It's not just, Hey, you want to come out, check us out. Like, and maybe I don't know, just throwing something, maybe Oregon would be able to do that. Like it, it's just, it, it's so different from, um, just like a free for all. It's not a free for all. Yeah. So I think that that's it. Um, the interesting thing about Penn State and the way that they've done it is you look at the last couple of years and they've stacked the front of that schedule. The first and second weekend in June are, I don't want to say priorities because everybody's got their own schedule. You got a guy like Jaden Blair that's going to come in the last weekend of June. He's still a priority. But right. most of the guys that are coming in the first couple of weeks are the ones that you're like pounding the pavement for. Like those are the guys that you're hardest on. And then you do that commit weekend where you bring in guys that are number one committed. And then you bring in guys that you think fit with what you're doing. And it also happens to fit with their schedule. So those first three weekends yeah. are in my mind, different than that final weekend, which that final weekend is really populated, but it, there's going to be, there's going to be a lower hit rate um, on guys that actually make that trip. So they've mm -hmm. got 50 scheduled right now, 40 of those guys will end up making it. And that includes, I think, the commits. So right. that's what you're working with here. And you want to get earlier in June. The interesting, I don't want to call it a wrinkle because schools have been doing it for a while, but there are programs out there that are getting kids on campus. Um, so Virginia Tech's doing this. Baylor's doing this in the next couple of weeks because this mm -hmm. window is next not just- week for their spring game. Sorry to cut yeah. you off. 
April to June is the window. Nobody really utilized April before, but right. some of these schools are going to get a chance to get guys. I don't want to, and it sounds very condescending here, but guys, they don't really have any business being in that June window with, um, but you get an opportunity to get on, get him on campus. And I'm not sure what the hit rate is going to be because if you're scheduling visits for June, you're probably not going to de decide in April, but Hey, you can press the right buttons and get somebody to commit. I look at Virginia with, uh, with, with some in-state kids, you know, like they've, they've done some, or excuse me, Virginia tech, uh, not Virginia, Virginia is kind of a mess, but Virginia <laughs> tech, um, they've, uh, they've done some really nice things to regain the ground that they lost yeah. under Justin Fuente. Brent Pry and his staff are doing a pretty good job with that. And maybe that's your window in. We talked about Penn State recruiting Florida and finding the right guys that aren't going to be the, the big three, the, the the school, the guys that are going to take officials to Florida, Florida State, Miami, but finding the right guys that, you know, your, your evaluation stick through. Virginia Tech's kind of in that situation because they are digging out of such a crater from Justin Fuente. And now you can maybe do the thing where you dominate the state do the things. And it's, it's really funny to watch Virginia Tech's recruiting pitch and how similar it is to what James Franklin did. And it makes sense because Brent Pry was here for so long and Michael Villagrana was here and now he's running recruiting for them. And Tyler Bones, the offensive court, so many things that Penn State does, even the graphics, even the way that they tweet, <laughs> even the yeah. things that they do is modeled after the way that they did at Penn State. Now, if you think about how Penn State did it when they got here, it's starting with in-state. It is establishing those relationships. God knows Blacksburg is is in Virginia, but also not in Virginia, if you've ever been to Blacksburg. Um, so that is what you have to do to dig that out and to get where they need to be. And those early spring official visits, which we're not used to seeing, are, I think, going to be a big part of that. Fitz, are we are we doubling as the Virginia Tech site uh, for on three as well, given how much similarity guys. there is? I mean, those guys are great. I mean, I, I didn't mention Michael Hazel, but there's a bunch of guys that are down there that are, you know, you got to work harder at that job yeah. um, to recruit than than you work at Penn State, just because it's it's such a like you, they the fact that they had as much success as they did in the seven five seven when you own a map like that does <laughs> not make sense. And uh, they've got to get back into that. Um, they got to you know get back into Northern Virginia and things like that. And it's it's really hard, especially when you have a limited window like uh, every college coach has these days. Ryan. Bob Tech has three intriguing official visitors of note this weekend. Jaden Blair, or next weekend, excuse me, Jaden Blair, Jeff Exner, both very important prospects for Penn State. I would put them up there pretty much near the top of both their positions. And then the third, Malik Washington. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it, you answered one of my questions, which I think is interesting because you can take unlimited visits and kind of going back to the original thesis of the question, you can take on unlimited visits. You don't have unlimited time. These are also high school kids. So like, mm -hmm. even if you extend into the fall, they have games and especially if they're high level recruits, they've got very important games. So, um, theoretically, like, I mean, can you take seven visits? Can you, can you, can a top athlete yes. stretch that out? Is there enough time where they could do, you know, kind of what you guys were talking about? And also, you got to remember, mid-April to pretty much throughout most of May is the spring evaluation period. So coaches are on the road the vast majority of that time. So that's why you're not really seeing a lot then. There are a couple that you, you will find, you know, a handful of guys who have a weekend here into here or there in May. But it's not it's not popular. Uh, coaches are trying to stay away from that if they can. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's if you want to do midweeks in June. Yeah, yeah, you can you can fit in a bunch, but uh, but yeah. I think at the, at the same time, man, like so, so many of these guys have been traveling so much for a year and a half now. Like, do you really want to keep adding more flights and more travel and more hotels? You know, I think that's a big reason why Zoller's is like, yo, we're doing these visits and we're getting this over with because uh, he didn't do as many visits as some lot so many other guys, but like it's definitely was wearing on him. Put it that yeah, way. Yeah, and I think I think the one tier that could really benefit from this unlimited visit thing is the, the schools that are not at the top of the list in their area, but they have tremendous talent. UCF, SMU are a couple that jump out to me that like, hey, this kid's going to pop up on campus and in no stratosphere, would you, or in, in no stratosphere was probably the right word, but no, in, <laughs> it, say, it's, sorry, it's almost 11 o'clock and I heard the recycling truck go, so I'm shaking, but I got, it <laughs> got some uh, residual PTSD, yeah. but like those, <laughs> those programs that have really good talent in their backyard and maybe have really good, maybe offer these kids as freshmen, offer these kids as sophomore, have good relationships. Maybe that's where this, where you see the unlimiteds coming in and be like, Hey, come, come check us out. Um, I, 
we can be done with the show here, but just this this conversation here, the Bain train has at the bottom of the uh, chat here. Demographic and geographic challenges of State College uh, are a unique problem, I believe. Um, so then, like, I hate when we just have kind of a period on a thought because and it's correct. But if you were to just drop State College into, I don't know, Harrisburg or Westchester, does that change? Does that change no, anything for you guys? Right, the camera's dead. The no. in the show. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what do you think, Sean? Uh, go yeah, I, I think it changes a good bit, actually. Like, yeah. hey, I compare, you know, you everybody compares Penn State and Michigan to each other. And the, the big difference there is that you can fly to Detroit and be right there. You can't really do that with State College, especially when you're talking about the um, uh, the challenges of flight prices and getting your whole family here and doing things in the middle of nowhere. Now, yeah. it's something that Penn State has worked against for a long time, and I think it's something that they've done well enough with but it's going to be it's going to be a big hurdle because it's not columbus it's not detroit um you know even south bend which is kind of the same has more accessibility um but then again on the other hand you're not syracuse so that's that's good so <laughs> yeah you know, there are there are schools that have it worse but not in terms of like big 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 time programs yeah, yeah, I see people all the time mention like, oh, you fly into Harrisburg only an hour and a half. Look, the vast majority of these guys are not flying into Harrisburg because of because of money reasons, flat out. I mean, they, it's usually Pittsburgh or Philly. I've even seen Baltimore, you know, if they're coming from down south uh, and then driving the rest of the way. And that does matter, especially when you can land in Columbus and be on, you know, be on campus 20 minutes later. And, and they yeah. and they fly them into State College for official visits. But we're talking about like right now, like when you're when you got to spend uh, 600 bucks to go to State College from texas or wherever you're yeah. coming from and then you multiply it by two or three that that is a deterrent right there yeah yeah i mean we uh i was trying to plan a vacation an actual honest to god vacation and i was comparing prices and oh wow the difference between pittsburgh and state college like that's yeah. that's some real money John that's Town. some real money when you're trying to travel yeah john town uh, yeah the john town the secret hit it oh. That's mine. Stop. <laughs> I don't care. I don't live up there anymore. HIA, <laughs> baby. Let's go. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you so much for your insight today. Thank you for all your hard work covering all of these recruiting situations from Matt Zollers, Trent Wilson, the recruiting visits coming up this week. And, and uh, you know, uh, I, I truly believe this. I don't, I say this all the time. I write this all the time. The best Penn State football recruiting information insight and perspective you can get literally anywhere that's why we built this team of having ryan and sean on the same team because they have been the best for a long time and over the last two years i feel like you could not find any well, better i've content. been the best i mean sean's uh... okay all right end the show end the show all right uh let's get going we'll talk to you on monday here on the bwi live show